So welcome to Instagram Live. This is where all the young people are. I can see that. I'm, I think I'm the only one with white hair, you know, basically. <laughs> okay, so to our audience, uh, me and Dr. Yaakob are not the youngest people here, so please forgive us for any technological potential disasters <laughs> later on. And I think, uh, let me just uh, get to it. Let me firstly welcome Dr. Yaakob, Professor Yaakob, uh, to our first session in this series, Te Tarik with Walid. And the idea is really to, to get politicians on so that we will discuss politics and policies uh, and have an open discussion. And you were the first person who I ever invited as a guest a speaker in my class. Uh, and I thought I wanted you as the first person for this as well. So thank you for obliging as, uh, as always. So my pleasure. Uh, just, just a, a, an, uh, an introduction on the series and then on Professor Yaakob before we get to the question. So uh, we, I will hopefully not be asking softball questions like, you know, what do you, <laughs> what do you think about before you sleep? <laughs> If you were not a politician, what would you do? <laughs> I'll leave that to mothership. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I will hopefully ask uh, tough questions, but fair questions. And I won't ask uh, gotcha questions. The point is not to ask yes or no questions and not, not let you or any guest uh, uh, have time to provide nuanced answers. Because politics and policies are complex, often require nuanced answers. So uh, I hope uh, we will have uh, the time for that. So the, the target is about 40 minutes because I've been told that from my students that's the attention span on okay. a good day for, <laughs> for students. So okay. hopefully, yes, uh, and everybody knows Professor Yaakob, he was the Minister of uh, Environment and Water Resources. His last post was the Information and Communication. Before that, it was uh, named communica Information, Communication and the Arts, I think until yes. 2012. Right. Yes, yes. And you were also minister, if I remember correctly, community of development and sports. Right. Yep. At that from, time, from, it was called. From, from two thousand and two to two thousand and four. Yes. All right. Okay. So uh, and minister of Muslim affairs as well. And he, yes, th throughout that sixteen years. Yes. Throughout that sixteen years. Right. So a veteran, and he was also the vice chairman of the PAP. So you went through a lot of uh, screening and recruitment as well of candidates. Right. Yes. Uh, as, yes. Right. Uh, for, so, former vice chairman of PAP. So, we are, uh, and he is recently retired. So, today we'll get the liberated version of <laughs> Professor Yaakob. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> okay. So, let's get to it. My first question for you is uh, on your retirement, should I say congratulations or commiseration? <laughs> No, I've, I've, I've always said it's a mixed feelings of both sad and happy. Sad because, you know, I'm living 23 years of my life behind in Kuala Mai, uh, not just in the constituency, but of course, 16 years as a minister and 23 years as a backbencher. So there's a lot of things that have happened in my life. And, you know, sometimes you feel all of a sudden there's a void. Uh, you still have attachment for Kuala Mai, but, you know, you can't go back because there's a new man there. You don't want to, you know, be there when he has to try and build up his case. Happy right. because now I have more time. Obviously, my Sundays, my weeknights are now free. Uh, time for me to do other things that I always wanted to do. Catch up on my reading, catch up on my writing. Of course, catching up with my family also, you know, basically. Mm -hmm. Because kids have grown and obviously, even though they are older, they still want to spend time. So, and of course, I must not forget my wife, you know, who's been around with me for the last 30 over years. And I need to spend more time with her and the things that we always wanted to do, basically. So it's both sad and happy and, you know, I'll, I'll try and find the right balance at some point in time, like, basically. And I, in fact, promised to my constituents that I met when I was doing, I was helping out in the campaign recently, that I'll be back. You know, I go to the market, I have food at the hawker center and uh, once in a while I drop by and, and you know, just, just to show my, my face there because, you know, I know those people. Mm. And I know when I, when I go to the hawker center, they give me the best food, you know, when I ask them, they say, no problem. Uh, you know, and, and I'm happy for the relationship that I have built up over these years. So right. So, so there's a comment that says that he, uh, he or she took uh, his or her K2 graduation photo with you. So that's how long you oh. have been there. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, GE 2020, what went wrong for your party? Ah, no, actually what went right is the most important question. We won the okay. election. Right? Okay. So we won the election, right? Must not forget that, you know, it was a hard-fought battle and we won. 
um, 60 over percent. Yes, as PM mentioned on the conference, we hope the numbers could have been better. So obviously, I think there's a lot of reflection that needs to be done. And this is something which all parties go through. I've been involved in five elections. And after every election, we, we do a deep dive to find out where we have sort of done well and where we need to improve. There's no doubt about that. I think the conventional wisdom will tell you that, you know, we, we basically did not get the, the voters of the younger population. What went wrong? What happened? I think we have to go and study it. But, you know, you read the report today uh, by ST that in January or February, in fact, right. the, the young was with us. Right, so exactly. So obviously, obviously something shifted, right? And what right. caused that shift? Uh, you know, that's something that we have to look back and see whether or not we can sort of prevent that from happening in the future. So I, I, I think that's it. I, you know, I just want to say also that I think the manifesto was actually the right one because, of course, the economy was very important. Jobs was very important. But obviously, it did not capture everything else that was mm. on people's minds, basically. And that's something which we need to study carefully. I, I think several ministers have said we have to do some really deep soul searching, and I hope we do. Right? We do so that we can understand and we can perform better. So all in all, I think you know, it's not a bad result. It's not a great result. But certainly, mm. we, with this result, we can move forward and learn and then hopefully we can improve as we go along. Right. I, think, I, I think that's a fair, a fair assessment. Uh, and I want to un unpack that a little because as you, as you rightly said, I, I, I think the Straits Times report today, for those who have yeah. not read, uh, should yeah. read it because it's an interesting empirical question. If that is true, and I think there's a lot of truth in that, that means the, the votes were lost during the campaigning. Yes, yes. I, right? I, I, would, I would agree to that because I was involved in the campaign for 90s. I helped out. Right. I walk around. And, you know, you, you can safely say that our vote bank is with the elderly. And mm. every elderly home that I go, they would say, no problem. Every young person that opens up the door will say, let me think about it. Then you know something is not right, right? Mm. So you, you, you get that sense that something has shifted. And so, what exactly? Is it because of the incident with the WP? Is it because, you know, we appear to be too arrogant or something like that? I think that's something we have to study carefully. I mean, you know, we have now time to look back. And you're absolutely right. I think something shifted during that nine days. And, and I think the party uh, stalwarts and leaders also knew that. You could see that we also shifted our campaign towards the end of the mm -hmm. last few days, basically. Right. right. So in a sense, in a way, we, 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 we read the ground correctly, we've understood it, but maybe it's a bit too late, but we're able to read the ground and change, you know, and change gear. So uh, in, in, in that sense, the machinery is working, but maybe we could have picked up those signals much earlier that would have been better. Basically. Yeah. Right. So from my own conversations uh, with... Okay, so there are two things uh, that I wanted to ask you on. Uh, one is from my own conversations, I think the younger people... Uh, and minorities, so of all ages, were extremely uncomfortable with what they perceived as uh, the unfair treatment of Raisa. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and as you know, actually, the, I, I can speak for the Muslims at least. The median voter for the Muslim is quite a conservative voter. <laughs> but, <laughs> right? But they, they also uh, felt very uncomfortable uh, at at what happened. And the yeah. younger people of all yeah. races, the Chinese yeah. as well, yeah. they were absolutely uncomfortable. Yeah. And the fact yeah. that Minister Shanmugam said, acknowledged that sort of, right? Yes. Basically. And I think uh, the term soul searching is a huge one. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. I, I, I right. think that's, that's the, I, I, mean, I, I think that's a right declaration on the part of the ministers that we need to do a deep dive. Uh, on the issue of the young, you know, I have two young first-time voters at home. You know, right. I mean, what did I mean, they you, say? What were their thoughts on, on I mean, the entire I mean, incident? Uh, to, to be very candid, they were not happy. They were not happy in how she's been treated. Uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, to them, you have to investigate. But when you bring it out right. in, the, in the middle of the election, it uh, doesn't appear fair. That's their perception, right. basically, right? right. Uh, we had a long family argument, you know. And, and, <laughs> and of course, <laughs> they are adults and they have, they have to know the of situation. And, and be, but I, I, I think that caused a lot of it. Uh, you know, even, even throughout the campaign, there was some sense that, you know, we, we, we need to basically reach out to the young because when, when we did this, I think, it, you know, it could have been a tipping point for young people because before that, people did say, yeah, I mean, let me think about what the PAP has to offer, you know. But I think that may have been the tipping point 
And people suddenly realize this is not the kind of politics that you need, you, you, you want to have in Singapore. So, uh, you know, I, I think we have to learn from the experience entirely. Lah. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean what she said was right. You know, I of mean, course. we have, to, we have to separate. That of has course. to be Understand. investigated. Understand. And, I, I, and I also appreciate uh, Mr. Pritam Singh's comment that we have to investigate after the election and everything like that. You know, I, I think that's fair. But I think at the moment of the battle, when you do something like that, it means that people are uncomfortable and they're not happy with it, basically. Especially okay. young people, basically. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I get, I'll get to my, the second thought I had on uh, the young, older, younger, older voter dichotomy or cleavage. Yes. Uh, but uh, now that you mentioned Pritam, uh, would you agree with me that he was the man of the match of this election? Uh, my honest opinion, he came up very well. I, 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 I have to be fair to him. I have seen all the videos. He appeared very composed, uh, very relaxed. And I think when he fronted the whole incident, mm. if I'm not mistaken, Saturday night when they had the press conference right. with the whole team, right. I mean, he, sh he showed leadership. I have to give right. that to him. He showed leadership that I'm the leader. I have to take this and I have to tell the way forward, basically. Um, so all in all, I, I, I thought he did pretty well. Uh, that, that's my honest opinion. I, I have to give that to him, basically. Yeah. Right. Okay. Th thanks for your candid... Uh, candid answers and I told you guys I'll, we'll get the liberated version <laughs> <laughs> but Professor Yakub has always been fair to me personally at least in spite of our vast disagreement so, uh, so I, I've always appreciated that so uh, the other thing I wanted to say this younger voter thing although uh, uh, whatever I said earlier I still stand by it with regards to my, my interactions with younger voters but I think there's more to that as well now you've shared uh, uh, your family arguments, uh, I want to share a little about my own family arguments. A person <laughs> in my family, an elderly person in my family is a lifelong PAP voter. And on the second day of campaigning, uh, he told me that he will be voting for the opposition this time because, because uh, of Tan Cheng Bok. He said, uh -oh. if Tan Cheng Bok left the party already. And now, he's not a West Coast voter. <laughs> but he says, so I'm thinking, apart from the younger uh, electorate, is there something in Tan Cheng Bok's defection where Tan Cheng Bok represents the old PAP, rightly or wrongly, okay? Because sure. I think there are questions that we need to ask of Tan Cheng Bok as sure. well. Sure. Uh, uh, especially if he's disavowing the party, right? So uh, I would love to have him on and ask him this question. So uh, is there something on the part of voters looking at Tan Cheng Bok as representing? So they like the PAP, but they don't like the 3G or maybe 4G more. And Tan Cheng Bok represents a return to that. Well, I did, I did, uh, to be honest, I did not pick up that vibe during that nine okay. years of campaigning. Right. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, his name never figured in all our conversation. Uh, but among my own circles, there are people who felt that he was a game changer in the West, basically. Uh, my honest opinion, I never expected him to do so well. Uh, because even though Dr. Tan Chembok was a party member, but he left a long time ago. Right. He left a long time ago. Right. Way before the 2011 presidential election, right? I mean, he, I, if my memory serves me right, he stepped down in 2006. So, and then after that, he must have parted company for whatever reason, and then he decided to contest the election in 2011. Um, so, I, do, I wouldn't consider him as a, sort of a hangover from the OPAP, right? And uh, in a way, I think the, the nostalgia among old people, if you ask me honestly speaking, is actually the, old, uh, uh, the Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. That, okay. that, that came out a lot. You know, that came so out did, a lot. So did, did Lee Sen Yang play a part then? If the Hardly. loyalty is... Oh, okay. Hardly. Right. Hardly. It was always about, you know, Lee Kuan Yew did a lot. Lee Kuan Yew said, so thank you, ma'am, kind of thing. Basically. You, you get that kind of feeling, basically. But I, 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 I can't, you know, say for certain, based on the nine days, that there was a Tanjim Bok factor. At least in Jalan Besar, I, I can't say that, basically. Okay, all right, thank you. So, uh, last one on the election specifically, and then we'll move to broader issues. Uh, this election was built as a referendum towards the 4G, right? So, how, how do they move forward? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, it doesn't look good for them. Uh, and no, what would your advice be as a seasoned campaigner? <laughs> what would your advice to them be moving forward? No, I, 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 think, I think the 4G knows what they need to do. And the simple answer is that they have to reconnect themselves with the ground. It's as simple as that, basically, right? You know, I, I, I go back to something which MM used to say this, uh, you know, and MM used to say that I should be able to shake your hand and look into your eyes and see whether I can trust you to look after my affairs, you know? 
And in, in not so many words, but that's what he used to say. Basically, I think that reconnection between the 4G and the ground has mm. to take place. Having said that, having said that, I think we have to be fair to the 4G. Some of the ministers have done quite well at the ground. Okay. I'll be very candid with that, right? Okay. I think Mr. Lawrence Wong, notwithstanding what people may say about his handling of the COVID, he has come across very well on top of the situation. And I think, you know, um, in terms of his personality, I know him quite well. I think he's basically a sort of person who's prepared to listen more rather than to tell you that I have the answer and you follow me, basically. Uh, Minister Ong Yee Kang, for example, I don't know him well enough, but I know of him and I've interacted with him to, to know that I think he has the ability to connect, basically. Mr. Desmond Lee. Mr. Desmond Lee actually is, is a fantastic minister to me. Quiet, resolute, but capable. Um, done well at MSF. And you ask the social service sector, they, they like him because they know that he's genuine, he's honest. So I think there are people within the 4G uh, ministers that actually can do that. And I'm sure the rest of Seoul can do that. I think we have to reconnect. And more importantly, I think um, there has to be something that is associated with the 4G as a vision, right? I don't know if you remember this when PM Go Chok Tong was about to take over. Their vision was uh, Swiss standard of living by 2020. Right. Yeah, there right. was something that you could pin down the, 4G, uh, the, 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 the PM Go's generation that this is one. I think you need something like that also for the 4G. And they talk about a crisis of a generation. I think this whole discussion about what a post-COVID world will look like, it should be headed by the 4G. It should be the 4G determining what Singapore will be like and then we can then relate to that or at least have a discussion with that, that this, this is the path that this group of ministers will lead me to basically. You know? I think that will be an exciting conversation. I hope to see that conversation about what a post-COVID post -COVID, uh, world will be like and how the 4G is going to shape that world together with us Singaporeans. I think that will be exciting. Uh, right. And there are many, many opportunities. You know, today I was involved in a conversation you know, on experiential learning. How would experiential learning take place in a post-COVID world? Right? When you actually mm. cannot, cannot go out physically, you have to do Zoom meetings and, and so on and right. so forth. But there are things that can be done. But you probably need certain changes, not necessarily policies, but other changes to facilitate, you know, uh, uh, experiential learning and so on and so forth. So I think the, the conversation is quite exciting. I, I, I like it, basically. So I, I, I like to see the 4G taking that and using that as a basis on which they engage Singaporeans. I think that would be wonderful. Okay. Thank you. I, I think that, that is very sound advice and I hope they... They take it seriously. And interestingly, the, the ministers you mentioned, probably if we were to do a straw pool, right, amongst uh, Singaporeans, most of them would say Ong Yekong. Uh, Ong Yekong. Ong, Yekong. Ong, Ong Yekong. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I should know that he's a minister of education. <laughs> <laughs> Ong Yekong. Minister Ong Yekong has done really well. Uh, especially his... I, I absolutely love what I thought was his enlightened policy with regards to the schools. Yes. He resisted closing schools and he said it would hurt the lower income more. And I thought that exactly. was ab absolutely, exactly. Right. absolutely exactly. wonderful. Uh, exactly. Uh, and Lawrence Wong, I think, would be high up uh, on a lot of people's uh, minds as well. Uh, so, interesting, I just noticed that. I'm, I'm really not trying to be naughty. Okay? I, I, just, <laughs> I noticed that you didn't mention DPM Wing or... Minister Chan Chun Singh, who are the top two. Uh, no, so... but, but, but you do realise the reason why I mentioned the other ministers because DPM Heng and Minister Chan received a lot of limelight during the 90s of campaign. Right, right, right. Okay, right, right, so right, I right, think right, right, right. people right. can judge for themselves. Fair enough, for themselves. Fair enough. Yeah. okay, okay. Fair enough. Okay, so uh, there are a lot of Muslim-specific issues that I, I will not deal with. Uh, not that because the questions are, are unfair, because you were the Minister of Muslim Affairs and you know, I have asked you many of those questions <laughs> myself. <laughs> but sure. I think this is not the platform and majority of the audience are, uh, are not from, they are from other faiths and sure. from maybe no faiths. But I'll, <laughs> I'll deal with the, with the broader questions on race sure. and religion, I guess, sure. where sure. everybody can relate to that. So uh, this election, we saw uh, many people, many minorities leading GRCs and winning. Minister Iswaran, Minister Shanmuga, Minister Vivian, Minister Ta SM Taman, uh, Mr. Pritam Singh, Masagos, and then you have uh, Mr. Murali in the SMC. And you yourself led uh, a GRC twice and won. Yeah. 
So what's the relevance of the GRCs then if the minorities seem to be able to <laughs> to win? No, I, I I suppose as a concept, like any other political concept, it will evolve over time, right? Uh, I think PM has made it a promise to reduce the average size. So this time around, we have smaller GRCs, more SMCs. And as you rightly pointed out, the SMCs have done well actually on their own. Even, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Murali did well in Bukit Bato. And previously, of course, Mr. Michael Palmer in Pongol East to show that minorities can also hold on their own in the SMC. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to prejudge what the government would think about how the political structure or the whole constitu uh, the constituency structure will take place. But certainly, the data shows that maybe we have arrived at a level of maturity where people look beyond race, right? Maybe when MM conceived the idea of the GRC, we were not there yet, right? Political maturity takes time. You know, I mean, I, I'll be honest about it. I mean, I mentioned this in one of my interviews. Uh, somebody asked me what was my greatest achievement in 23 years. I see my greatest achievement in 23 years as an MP is that all of them never questioned my race. Never question my race, right? Because to, 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 in effect, what we do there, we do it as an elected representative. It doesn't really matter your Malay or Chinese are needed. Everyone is a Singaporean that deserves help. So I, I, I think the GRC concept will evolve over time. I think something that has to be looked at, basically, will we remove it and revert to all an SMC? I, I'm not so sure. I, I wouldn't want to prejudge that, basically. But I certainly would recommend a re-looking at the whole concept, you know, looking okay. at what we have. Because I think it has to be something that we evolve over time as we achieve certain political maturity. Hmm. Would you think that, I, you know, be, I, I am quite supportive of the GRCs actually, and I still am. Sure. Although I think I have to rethink uh, that as well, looking at the, the data we have. Especially in Aljunied, we had three minorities. Exactly. Three exactly. minorities. And, yeah. and also, if we look at, uh, you mentioned that uh, your constituents never saw you as a Malay leader. They saw you yeah. as a... Never, right? Yeah. Uh, and nobody sees uh, SM Taman as an Indian leader. Exactly. exactly. Or Pritam Singh as an Indian leader. They see exactly. him as a national leader. Exactly. Uh, so uh, that, uh, that tells us something, right, about, yeah. about GRCs and race. So uh, is it true that Singapore is still not ready for a non-Chinese PM? <laughs> I thought you were not going to ask me difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I wouldn't say I've done a straw poll to, to um, come to any conclusion, but based on my own interaction, and I will add here, we both Malays and non-Malays. I, I think people feel that SM Taman is certainly way above everybody else and capable of becoming a prime minister. I think we cannot take that away from him. I know him well enough to work with him in cabinet that he's a very capable man. So I think it's, it's you know, that's, that's all I can tell you in terms of what I've heard, right. what I've shared, what I've said basically. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so I would like to maybe push it uh, a little bit on that and uh, sure. maybe defend DPM Hing uh, on his statement because I don't think he was not right actually yeah. when he said yeah. Uh, yeah. some Singaporeans are not ready. Yeah. Yeah. Although, uh, yeah. I think as a generic non-Chinese, maybe some Singaporeans are not ready. Yeah. But for SM Taman, I think many Singaporeans are ready. So basically, yeah. does it mean yeah. that a minority always has to be heads and shoulders no. above everybody no. else? Then? No. You don't think so? I, I, I think the, the, the right answer for me is that maybe we're not ready for minority PM, but we're ready for Taman. Right, right, think, right, right. Yeah, right, 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 right. Because right. I agree. in a way, I people agree. see SM Taman as a very capable person, you know, and they, they don't see his race. So right. uh, it's, it's, it's right. two different things, basically. So I yes. suspect if you do a survey, even among older Chinese, I suspect they say, yeah, Taman very right. good. I right. suspect. Right. I, right. I may be right. wrong. Right. So right. I have to add the caveat. I've not done a poll. I have no idea. But that's how I think it should be seen. Basically. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, on the broader topic of race and religion, and especially uh, Ong Yakang, Minister Ong Yakang has said uh, <laughs> just now, yeah. Uh, that schools yeah. have to relook yeah. and yeah. Minister Shanmugam uh, have said as well. So, yeah. has it, uh, so practically, how do we do that without, uh, without always using the harsh stick of the law whenever somebody says something wrong? Or should we allow for people to make mistakes when they are discussing race and religion? What do you think? It's a very I tricky situation. It's, it's a very tricky situation, a very fine line. And some people will cross the line, mistakes will happen. 
I think it's always a question of what we do with the mistakes, you know, and uh, I, I think more should be done to understand why it happened and so that we can, in a way, explain to the rest of the community why we think this is not uh, desirable. I think the, the OB markers or the red line is very difficult to define. But I would welcome what Minister Ong Ye Kang has mentioned and Mr. Shamukum has mentioned that young people are looking at race from a different perspective and therefore we need to have a new framework. I welcome that. I think the acknowledgement that we need to sort of have something new is very healthy, right? Mm. If you ask me now, I have no idea how to do it, okay? Uh, right. you, you know me personally that I can have very private conversation, but publicly, I think it's, 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 it's going to be something be of a challenge, basically, right? But ultimately, I think when we talk about race and religion, I mean, there are very simple rules that we must avoid. I mean, if you insult a race or religion, that's really bad, right? But if you come out and say, I think this is what the Malay community is all about and I'm not sure whether it's right, then it, you, you can debate it based on facts and data and what have you, basically, right? So I, I, I would welcome an honest discussion, right? Mm. You feel that there's something wrong with the Malay community. Tell me why. Tell me why right. based on the facts. Then I can bring my facts to have a discussion. I think that should be healthy. But if you start insulting the community, insulting other people's religion, I think that's no-no. So I think that line is very clear, right? Because why you want to antagonize people? Why do you want mm. to feel, you know? But if you feel something is not right and you have a certain view and you want to advance it, by all means, and then have a discussion. And then if you're proven wrong, you should retract your position. I think mm. that is, is what should happen. But can this happen at every level of society? I'm not so sure, right? Mm. Because I think this is something that has to be an informed discussion based on, on data that you have and the facts that you know of, basically. I, I, I would welcome, I mean, if any, any non-Malay want to have a discussion with me about the state of the Malay families, for example, I, I would welcome that. And in fact, people have written about it, right? Tanya Lai and right. so on and so forth have right. written about the Malay community. I, I don't find it upsetting. I read it to understand some of which I don't agree, right? And some of which I agree. So I think if we can have an honest discussion at that level, I think that, 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 that's okay, right? I, you, we don't have to agree with everything that you say, right? right? right but at the right, end right. of the day, as long as it's based on facts, data, and something which is very clear, I think we can have an honest discussion. Right. Okay. So, uh, still, still on that, and I wanted huh. to uh, get your, your thoughts as well, because uh, the GFC system is such that a Malay or an Indian is typically elected because he or she is Malay or Indian, <laughs> right? And he or she is expected to represent the Malay and Indian communities. But the Malay and Indian candidate is elected by Chinese, Everyone. essentially. Yeah. Mostly yeah. Chinese, majority yeah. Chinese. So the majority yeah. of the constituents that you are, uh, uh, that you are elected by uh, is not the... The, the constituents that you are supposed to serve. So, uh, so in the sense that uh, minority MPs have two constituents. So you, you as ministers, you have three constituents. You serve the entire country as a minister. You serve Jalan Besar or Mulmin Kalang, right? Kolamai as, as your MP. But you serve the Muslim community, uh, yeah. Malay community as a Malay yeah. MP. Yeah. How do you balance that? Because, uh, and I think I, I never... I never saw the balance or I never knew where the line was. Uh, on one hand, you are supposed to be Malay. On the other hand, you cannot be too Malay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 think, I think, first of all, the GRC system was not created so that there is a Malay to represent the Malay community. I think the GRC system was created to allow minority representation in parliament so that our parliament reflects our society, right? That's, that's the logic. And as you rightly pointed out, as an idea, it is definitely something that we can support because we do want our parliament to reflect our society, right? So that there's a balance of different communities in parliament. So that's the first thing. What I do personally, and I think what other Malay PAP MPs do for the Malay community is because we are part of the community and the community expects us to help them in one way or the other, right? right. So, in my case, of course, it was slightly different because I have the title of Minister of Muslim Affairs. Right, right. So, right. every Muslim in Singapore is, is part of my responsibility in right. terms of the laws governing them and so on and so forth. So, I think by and large, based on my own observation 23 years, I think all the PAP Malay MPs have actually, in fact, done quite well in, in terms of balancing that. So, you look at the hand side and look at the questions raised 
baik vaksin Mr. Sakti Andi, Mr. Zaina Sapari, or, or Dr. Intan, Mr. Rahayu, and all that. The, the range of questions raised across the whole spectrum, not just on Malay community, right? If anything, they raised a lot of Malay issues only during the budget debate, only because there is a segment on Muslim affairs, right? So I, I think that balancing act is all right. And when we go out, you're absolutely right. We do have the added constituency. So, you know, we have to attend Malay functions, we go to Malay organizations, not because we have to, but we want to also because whether or not, uh, you know, we attend or not, they are still voters. They are still part of the constituency. They are still part of the uh, Singapore framework, uh, Singapore fabric, you see. So I, I, I don't see that as a problem, uh, but it is, of course, an added burden for all of us. But I would gladly tell you that all of my colleagues when I was in parliament, you know, they, 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 they look forward to it. They, they, they don't see this as a challenge. And I think being close to the Malay community helps us also to have ears on the ground to understand what the needs of the concern of the community. And I can be honest here, when I was minister, when I do receive certain feedback from the Malay ground, which I think requires the attention of our senior leaders, I bring it to their attention, right? That's my job. So, you know, we, we need to alert what is going on, what is unhappiness and so on and so forth, so that senior leaders can decide what is they need some policy change or something needs to be done. Um, so for my 16 years as Minister in Church of Muslim Affairs, I make it a point to make sure that I always brief our senior leaders so that we un they don't understand what the Malay community is going through, what are the challenges. Um, so, uh, so by and large, I think it's not a problem so far. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, last one on race and uh, religion sure. in general. Yeah. So uh, the Workers' Party candidate Fadli Fauzi, he talks mm. about mm. looking at uh, issues, socio-economic issues through a class rather than a racial lens. Yeah. And yeah. I thought this is something uh, you would uh, appreciate yeah. as a student yeah. of Professor Hussein al yeah, yeah, And I yeah. thought this was something... What, what, what are your thoughts on that? This is an audience question, by the way. So. No, uh, I, I totally agree with him, but I have a small caveat. Eh? Let me start okay. with the first part. I agree. At the end of the day, we have to look at it not from a racial point of view, but from an economic point of view or social point of view, see what is happening and how we can deal with that problem. But yet, at the same time, I think you also need some inputs from the community that may be affected the most, right? And, and are there certain factors within that community that need some attention, right? Uh, let, let me give a recent example which all of us are familiar with, basically. I would say, and I will add a caveat that I don't have the data, but I would say, you know, predominantly home-based businesses are largely Malays, right? And we saw this in the recent episode, basically. Right. And they were affected by the COVID-19 and so on and so forth. Now, I think it requires somebody who has an understanding of the community, why home business business are important, so that I can come in and say, okay, I need to do something and help you. We have a national concern, which is COVID-19. How do I deal with this issue and to help you, basically? So I think both sort of lenses, if I use their lenses, help one another, basically, rather than trying to say, it is a Malay problem, all right? No, it is a problem at the national level, but one part of that national community is facing a lot more challenges. And how do you deal with that, basically? Do you need policies at the national level? Or do you want to go in and say, okay, maybe I need to understand this community better and how I can affect a change uh, in a positive direction? So I would, I would cover it that way, basically. So he's not wrong. But I think at the same time, I think understanding of what is going on in the community will be very helpful for us to formulate policies. I mean, okay. you know, uh, I, I, you can look at many policies that has helped the Malay community, even though it was a national policy, like, you know, trying to uh, increase home ownership, for example, right? Because there were a lot of Malays in rental blocks at one time. I, mm. I think it has helped a lot of the Malay community, even though it was not seen from a Malay angle, but it was very helpful to the Malay community. And I, when I was uh, an MP and a minister, I always try to promote the uh, Malays who are staying in rental blocks to become homeowners as much as possible through the various schemes that the government has uh, planned out. Right. So uh, I'll move on because uh, we only have about 10 minutes left and maybe we can have <laughs> 15, 15 minutes left. But I think, I, I don't know, you don't have to uh, say anything. I think the home-based business uh, issue wasn't well handled from the get-go. Uh, and that is why President Halima had to step in as well. I mean, that's all. I don't, I don't need a comment. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Uh, uh, the next question is on the cabinet. And you held uh, a few positions. And I think probably, uh, is it fair to say that the Minister of, uh, Ministry of Information Communication, that was a highest portfolio you held? Or? Yeah. 
Right? I mean, it's okay. first time, first time ever by Malay lah, basically. Right, right, right. So that that would be the highest. Uh, uh, have you ever gone to the PM and said, "I want this"? <laughs> I mean, and I'm thinking, right? I'm, I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking uh, from an educator to an educator. <laughs> I'm well, sure. I'm sure. I, as a professor, I'm sure you would have wanted the Ministry of Education. For instance. <laughs> I, it's I, natural. <laughs> I, I, you know, I can't say all those things because I'm sworn okay. to the official secrets. Understand, right? understand. But understand. If, if you ask me, yeah, I would have loved to be at the Education Ministry. Right, uh, it's right. indeed very challenging. You're shaping right. the next generation. But, you know, um, as a Muslim, we have to take what is given, you know, and you're grateful. <laughs> <laughs> you're grateful and you do the best you can, basically. All right, all right, okay. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I also think that we have had some fantastic uh, education ministers as well. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Sam Tam and DPM Heng yeah. and yeah. Uh, Minister yeah. Ong Yekang. Ong Yekang, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I just, I'm just wondering whether that's, uh, that has been on your mind. But okay, so... Uh, there was a question on censorship since uh, you were the Minister of Information <laughs> and Communication and the Arts. Uh, so do you, there, there is a saying which goes that uh, if you want to check the soul or the, the soul of a nation, you check the state of the arts. Yeah. Right? For me, I, I, agree, uh, I agree with that with one caveat. I think another way to check the soul of a nation is through the voting patterns. <laughs> but I, defin I definitely agree that uh, the arts is an important part of our society but with uh, censorship actual or self-censorship is very difficult for the arts to flourish yeah. uh, so what what do you think what what are, what are your thoughts on that no i think when you look back um, the honest truth is that when i took over the ministry in 2011 um, when we look back across maybe 10 20 30 years starting with actually the report by the late mr ong ting chong you know to build the renaissance city I think there has been a lot of movement in terms of relaxing. It, you know, you can never reach to a point where both sides will agree. That's, that's the honest truth, basically, right? Um, let me give one example, which I thought is an interesting example, but it doesn't relate to the arts. It's more to the internet. Because one of my first act when I became Minister for Communications in the Arts uh, was we came out with the online uh, licensing, licensing sites, you know, basically. And... It was a big hoo-ha. The internet community was very upset and they basically said this is going to curtail the internet and it's a form of censorship and so on and so forth. Uh, through a good friend of mine, I will not mention names, uh, I had a meeting with a lot of these people at, a, at an institution to explain why we're coming from. I mean, they, they disagree with me, but they appreciate the opportunity to discuss with the minister. After we implemented the law, we only licensed about 10 sites. And then, you know, years go by, nothing has happened to the internet. So, I mean, I, I met one of them a couple of years later. I say, look, you remember the discussion we had, right? So at the end of the day, what, the point I'm trying to make of the example is that sometimes when we act, primarily because we think there is a certain purpose. So in this case, it was after the 2011 election and there were a lot of sites, right? They were commenting on Singapore affairs and so on and so forth, and they were not licensed in a way for them to be held responsible. Not we're going after them, but you made a comment, you must be held responsible, right? So I think in the arts, it's also a similar way. We, we want to relax as much as possible, but how do we do it? Maybe sometimes we come across a particular show or a film that we think has crossed the line, and we need to deal with that basically, right? And so when we deal with that, people assume we're trying to clam on the arts. We are not. There was a specific problem with that particular script. In fact, you can ask some of the artists, you know, after 2011, Alfian actually had a play. And had, had a play, basically. I can't remember the title, but it went through, came to my table, everybody looked at it and all that stuff. We made some minor changes, but by and large, we allowed it. And he was commenting on the 2011 elections, right? Because when we lost our junior GRC and all that stuff. So I think to be fair to the government, we have always trying our very best to make sure that the space for the arts continue to grow. That I can speak with conviction, because I was in the ministry for seven years, and you know, I, I'm not. I mean, I was in the ministry, but arts portfolio left me and went to Mr. Right. Lawrence Wong. Uh, but we were the regulator, and whenever something comes across our table, we always want to see whether or not we can find a way to, for the lack of a better word, you know, to to see how we can make sure that the show can go on. Uh, can we work with the producers and what have you? So I'd be very candid. All my officials in the ministry, uh, the last thing we want is just to clamp down. Certain shows. Clearly, you know, I mean, 
there are some groups that we don't allow for obvious reasons and what have you, basically. But the vast majority, I have never been attempted by the government. I, and, and I think all of us would like, want to see the flourishing of the arts, certainly, basically. And in fact, you look now, there have been a lot of place, you know, cynical of some government policies of the party. And I don't think you ask them, has anything happened to them? We, don't, we have not. So I think, you know, you must always understand from the government's point of view, it's a lot more easier for us to allow everything, lah, you know, less headache for us. But I think we also have to safeguard because we live in a multiracial society. We do not know how that play will react. I mean, you, you remember the, the, the famous Indian Muslim play, Talak? Mm, Talak, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. People forget that I was intimately involved in that play. Uh, mm. and, you know, and uh, I went to the opening. I was invited. Right. I, was, I was a young... But over the years, uh, you know, uh, people realized that it was not something and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think that, that, that it has to be not been allowed. But at that time, I thought it was a useful play to discuss about what is happening in the Indian Muslim community. But obviously, our Indian Muslim community leaders were not happy. We consulted them and we agreed with them. And I think eventually, I think the minister at that time, I can't remember, it was Dr. Lee or whoever, they made the decision that we shouldn't allow it. So... The point I'm trying to make is that I think there's always an attempt to reach out to the artists to understand so that we can come to a certain position that both can agree with. Right. Uh, it sounds like you're, an, you're a fan of Alfian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, uh, by the no, way, the he, comments... Uh, sorry. Yeah. I, sorry. No, he, 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 I love his works. I, I read all his works, you know, basically. And I, I have to tell you this, and this is a real story, you know. I, when I was still a young uh, sort of backbencher, uh, I went to a conference in Trinidad and Tobago, um, way in the Caribbean, and I brought one of his books, right? Maybe the, the first one, One Angry Hour or something like that. And in that conference, there was a Trinidadian poet who happens to be a politician. So we were talking of poetry and anything. Then I, I said, I have this book from a young Singaporean. Would you like to see it? So he took home and read it. He came back the next day and said, this is wonderful. He said, I've never seen this writing before and all that stuff, you see. I never have a chance to tell Alfian that, basically. You know? But the point <laughs> is that he's talented. And we cannot right. take that away from him, basically. You know? So someone who knows Alfian, please pass the message to him. I, <laughs> I am also a fan of his voice. <laughs> and I think he's a voice we need. We don't have to agree with everything he says. Exactly. He's a voice, yeah, exactly. he's a yeah. voice we need uh, in yeah. the country. Yeah. Uh, so uh, on censorship still, and it's beyond, beyond the arts, right? And... Uh, that may be your position and that may be the official government position. But with the, the idea that your place can be censored or even with POFMA around, uh, the worry is, and not just POFMA, there are other laws as well. The worry is you do not need to get to the stage where the government censors you. People, uh, people censor themselves. And I'm going to quote somebody you know pretty well, Professor Chiran George. <laughs> he says... <laughs> He says a lot of censorship in Singapore actually happens through self-censorship. And it's not directly through the government, but because of the OB markers and the ambiguity of what is moral, what is not, what is acceptable, what is not. So what, what is your comment on, on that self-censorship? Uh, I, I think if it's happening, it's unfortunate. I think young Singaporeans especially should, for my honest opinion, push the boundaries a bit more. I think in any society, this is basically an ongoing process of negotiations between the authorities and the artists. That's a fact of life, right? Some people try it and then, okay, they cross too much and then they get sort of pushed back. Others try it and they get away with it. So I, I don't have an answer for that. But, you know, I think it's a pity if our young creative talents feel that they need to self-censor themselves. We will lose something, right? And at this point in time in our society as a nation, where we are developing and I think we are, we are, I wouldn't say we have reached to a level of 100% maturity where we can expect race, language and religion. I think there are still areas in which we can evolve and I really like to see, not just to see young people, but our artists evolving that together with society. Uh, it would be a pity then we will lose out in the potential of a good play, of a good writing and, and so on and so forth. So I, I would recommend them. don't hold back and you know, Give your best shot and, 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 and see what happens. Okay. So we do not have any more time. Do you have any 
final things that you wanted to say that I didn't get to <laughs> ask on, or anything that you wanted to get off your chest? <laughs> no, I, I, no, no, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm out of politics, but I'm still a party member. Never forget that, basically. I'm still a member of the PAP, and I will continue to be a member. I, I think the most important thing to all the young people who's listening in, I appreciate what, you know, they feel and how they feel about Singapore. I'm always reminded by MM. MM always say, you know, he doesn't care who's in charge as long as Singapore is safe and survive, basically, you know, because that's the most important thing. In all of these things, I think the most important thing is that Singapore as a nation that we know can continue to try, prosper, and is led well. So as MM says, if the PAP cannot run it and there's another party that can run it, then you should let the party to run it because it's the future of Singapore. I think that's important, right? So we are in this together. We're in the same boat, basically, right? Maybe not a sampana, we're in the same boat, basically, right? <laughs> but, but we have to make sure, right, no matter what our differences are, basically, that we can continue to survive. I mean, that's a fact of life. You know, people don't like the fact that PAP talk about jaws. But hey, it's a reality, you know? It's a reality whether you like it or not, right? You need to be able to have gainful right. employment. But I will be the first to admit that as a society, we can change how we look at people who are out of work or people who are working, how we can support each other and so on and so forth. I think that COVID-19 has shown that there is something in the Singapore spirit that we're capable of doing under a lot of pressure. I, if we can really, you know, ensure that spirit continue to prevail, I think we'll have a better Singapore. So to me, to all the young people out there, let's work to build a better Singapore, right? At the end of the day, we have to continue to survive as a nation. Right? I think one day the young people will become parents and you'll think about the same thing. How do I put food on the table? How do I ensure a roof over my head? Those are real issues. You know? I agree that some people may not be, 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 be happy with the way we have organized society, but nothing is cast in stone. We can always evolve and change. And if there's a better model out there, they can achieve the same outcome, yet at a lesser price to pay in terms of people's happiness and wellness, so be it. So I, I, would, I would like young people to be involved in this because I've always said, you know, Singapore is always a work in progress. It's never completed. It's never done. It's not about building another new building, but building a better society that all of us can thrive in and, and the human spirit can continue to flourish. That would be my message. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was lovely. And I think uh, it is in that spirit that you see younger people wanting yeah. Yeah. the PAP to still be in power, but a more diverse parliament. Yes, yes. In, I, in I accept that. Uh, I accept that. Right. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Yaakov. You've always been a gentleman to me. I just thank wanted you, to acknowledge. I wanted to acknowledge that. Thank and you. please ask your uh, your teammates to come on my show as well. <laughs> you, you, have, <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to ask them. I cannot be your marketing, okay, I will. I will. I cannot I will. be your marketing manager. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, thank everybody. you so much. Okay, okay. good night, good night. everyone. Good night. Okay, thank bye you. Everyone. Thank bye you, bye. Prof. Bye.